हेलो या चंदन हेलो कैन यू हेयर मी या या चंदन ऑनलाइन ओके ओके विल स्टार्ट नाउ या शो प्लीज so as uh, last time we uh, talked a little bit about uh, the content of the session so we'll start uh, this one so this whole training program will be divided into eight modules and for, for today is the first module we'll have devops basics and some tool setup on the pc side so that uh, you can do the assignment or whatever uh, we do second module we'll go through linux virtualization which will include virtualization and containerization the containerization is also one kind of virtualization it just takes it to the very lightweight access so we'll cover how to do a uh, simple virtualization using vagrant and how to deploy a package and a uh, similar uh, style using container and third we will uh, start touch on the automation part automation i'll start with ansible before actually diving into python because ansible will be very easy to understand if someone has no programming background so that will be good starting point you can see how the installation works how you can actually see very simple linux stuff how you can do it very easily and conveniently and uh, and you'll see how the power of these automation tools like ansible puppet or anything they goes beyond a shell or bash scripting because shell or bash was mostly designed on a shell on a single system basis but as are with the cloud and uh, so many subsystems are coming into picture so often a system administrator or a devops guy they are probably managing at least 30 or 40 uh, instances at least when i say instances i mean it could be virtual machine it could be container and it is impossible to do with a shell script so this is where you need these kind of remote access uh, tools which allows you to consolidate all your configuration management to single uh, script and execute at bulk at the bulk level everywhere and then fourth module we will talk about python so python is uh, although it is introduction in python but it will actually teach you basics of uh, programming language any programming language because it will it will have some theory and also practical theory i will emphasize because uh, see today is python tomorrow something else will come and it is no longer we are in 1990 where you learn you came out of school you learned a technology and since 20 years you are doing the same thing and there is no problem but nowadays technologies the life cycle has changed now from 20 years it has become 3 to 4 years maximum or peak time is usually 2 years of any technology so uh, so today's python something else will come but if you have the fundamental and the concepts then you can learn anything new pretty quickly so it will focus on that and then we'll deep dive into python in terms of how we can use data structure how can use to programming how can you loops and all those kind of things once we have a, a, a set up a base comfort level in python then we'll do automation using python so pretty much we'll do the same thing what we did with ansible and those automation we'll do with python so as a system administrator or devops what daily things you may need to do so we'll uh, try to code in python and do it. and as with every session we'll have some assignments that uh, will be posted in github and then you guys will uh, do it and you can ask any question or anything like that and module 7 will be uh, it will be cloud automation cloud automation when i say i'm talking about amazon aws or azure will pick one service and stick with it and practice how we can instantiate a instance how we can create in instant deploy in instant delete adding firewall rules those kind of stuff and then uh, the eighth uh, will do the full devops stack which is using jenkins pipeline so as a devops because uh, so this this is the whole thing of it so today we'll go on devops basics and and the whole breadth of it how because it's a very vague term when we talk about devops unlike system administrator you know there is a specific job for this guy and it's a very mature uh, a uh, job profile system admin it has been there for like 50 years but uh, devops is is not very new but uh, with the cloud technology the definition of devops has been blurred and it covers a lot of it so you cannot be devops engineer from a to z you you usually focus 
and specialize into one particular site. So we'll uh, touch base on that today. So this session uh, will have uh, every session will have theory, practical concepts, and which will have some exercises, hands-on training, and uh, uh, training uh, uh, artifacts will be given like script files, uh, lab exercise. Most of it will be uh, in a GitHub fashion. If you guys, I'm assuming you guys don't know GitHub, so I'll today I will uh, do that as well, so that we prepare for what next to come. And software PC setup is a virtual box we need, Python need, and a Amazon free tier account. So let's start with the module one. So module one today we'll talk about uh, overview of DevOps and the DevOps versus sysadmin, how they are overlapping or not and evolution of DevOps and DevOps use cases and technology stack. So this is will uh, this is more of an introductory session to get on with uh, anybody trying to, even as a system administrator you are, you must be doing a lot of DevOps work, but you just don't know it. And also the branding of DevOps is very important because the moment uh, you say system administrator, your maybe your pay salary, maybe $30, $40 an hour, the moment you say DevOps, it immediately goes to 100 bucks an hour. That's it. That's the bottom line. So the branding is also important. And in order to do the branding, you should be able to understand the fu uh, fundamental concepts. And, and then you are able to understand the theory, and which is very important in any interview. If you're going for an interview, and it's very easy to find out if a guy from coming from a DevOps mindset or a system administrator mindset, and it dramatically uh, its employability of the person. So introduction is that. So DevOps, the, it's a, if I going uh, with the Wikipedia definition, it is a typical, it says DevOps, the full form is development and operation. So you, your responsible will be to developing operation activities. Operation activities, which in a, any software company or any technology-based company, is usually you have a bunch of developer, you have a bunch of testers, and you are, you are also the system administrator who is actually managing the system. And your job is to make sure that developer, uh, his or her environment is smooth. Tester, they have all uh, necessary tools, and you have a means to deploy the code. So taking example of a, say you are a web development company and they are doing a web base, uh, uh, they have a bunch of developer testers. And as a DevOps guy, usually most of the cases you will be hired to automate the end-to-end -end process. Automate end-to-end -end process mean you should be able to create a pipeline which will allow say uh, as a developer you check in a code. So if you're not familiar with check-in, just let me know. But checking the code is like you have a source control repository and usually in a, if you are a developer, usually write a code and you save it somewhere in a centralized repository, which you can actually, you can version control it. You can see what version happened, which happened. So whenever a developer checks into their, their code, say end of day code or maybe end of a release code, which could be a two week cycle or a one week cycle. I'm talking about agile environment. So the, whenever they do the check, check in the code or merge the code into a particular branch, you kick in a uh, pipeline. Pipeline mostly using Jenkins or, or a team city. There are a lot of tools or a code deploy, urban code deploy. One of these tools you'll be using to do the pipeline. So pipeline, what it'll do, it will go and pull the code from the repository, compile the code. Once the compilation is done, it will, uh, in the Java file world, to compile, after compilation, you will get a jar file. So those jar files will be pushed into an artifactory. Artifactory is another server where it's a repository for binary packages, not for the source control. Source code are stored in a different kind of repository, which is could be Git or SVN. And these binary objects are stored in an artifactory. It's like kind of a your uh, the same way you have Android or Google, you download packages from online. So same way it is somewhere in the artifactory, it will store it. And next phase, what will do, probably if you are having a completely agile environment, you may be instantiating some uh, environment. Maybe you're creating virtual machine on the fly. And once it is done, you install basic packages. And then next step, what you do, you automatically deploy that package into that uh, particular newly created system. And once that is done, 
you will probably fire a bunch of scripts. You are not writing those scripts which will do the testing, but you will enable those scripts to be called in your pipeline and it will do some automated testing. If the automated testing is successful, and then you go ahead and deploy the code into production. So this is a typical uh, uh, pipeline world it is called. So you, what you do, you do create, plan, package. One side is development. So this is your development side too. And second side of your work is you do the release management, configuration management and monitoring. So left side, when I say dev, it is usually development work you're doing. On the right side, it is for mostly for operational work. Operational work could be uh, like these kind of release management, configuration management, and monitoring. So if you see the DevOps is actually the, the whoever is responsible DevOps is, uh, although the, there is a higher pay band to the DevOps or whatever it is, but in true fact, the DevOps person is actually doing multiple people's job. If I go back, say, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I used to see job profile like they will hire someone as a configuration management. There used to be a guy, a particular stand full-time job there was to manage the configuration. It means manage the version control, creating the uh, development tree and those things. Those jobs are disappeared. It's gone. They used to be system administrator. They will, their only job was to manage a Linux box. Basically, they will uh, upgrade, the uh, apply the patches, reboot it. Uh, whatever uh, you have day-to-day -day job of a running a Unix uh, server that used to be done and then used to have build engineers they were specialized to do the build automation around it so like building and mostly once your application goes very complex the build process also becomes very complicated you have multiple dependencies, you have to download this that so usually they used to have build engineer as well and then you have a test automation guy their job is to not to write the test case. They will do the they will do the test automation. So, in a testing team, and this is I'm talking really is any software company. These types of things you can apply any any company who is using a technology based uh, solution. Like it could be a bank also. It could be a any financial institution or uh, oil, gas, and oil anywhere. Wherever they are using a technology stack, these was typically job role used to be there. And it's still there. It's not, everybody hasn't moved. It's, I will say like maybe 20% people have moved. And these uh, jobs are still there in the market, but they sooner or later, they will all be replaced. And they are being replaced very quickly, especially in North America. In India, it will happen maybe in a few years of time. And uh, you have a production deployment and the same, usually the configuration management person used to do the production deployment as well. And then you have a monitoring guy. Their job was just to look at the screen and create monitoring script and make sure everything is up and running. And though, so DevOps, the whole, if you see, your job is actually wearing multiple hats and replace all of them as a one single guy. So this is the reason they're paying double the system admin or anybody. But there's a reason also you're paying five, you're doing five people's job at the same time. And if I'm, if I were to do these five jobs and using old tools like bash scripting, if I'm managing those bash files or I'm doing like uh, rebooting here and there, it is just impossible. You cannot do it. So this is the reason you have to automate every, every single piece. Each and every piece has to be automated. Otherwise is impossible. So when you, if you are coming from a, uh, like a, from a, like a, say any of these particular job role people. Usually these people will go to, say if I'm configuration management, I'll go to somewhere buy a, a configuration management software or something like that. So these people historically has been buying different kind of software and they have been managing those software. But the problem was none of these had any development experience. None of them were developer or they couldn't even write a code. Most they could do is write really good bash script. But the Bash script, the problem is, Bash is a, amazing. It's the best thing you can see for a Linux management system. The problem is, it beyond a certain point of time, complexity goes, the complexity of Bash script goes exponentially high. And it becomes almost impossible to maintain. I worked in Builder, like 10 years ago, I used to see some Bash script, like they were written like 20 years ago. And they are so complex that you just cannot modify anything. It's just so complicated. And the problem is, as a programming language, evolution of any programming language, how it, like first programming language was C programming, right? You have the assembly and then you had C. And then C was great 
for system development. And then when people started using application development, they realized something is missing. That is how the object-oriented programming came. And then they realized how object-oriented programming can be very helpful in plug-and-play fashion. And, and then it kicked off and so many programming languages got developed. So once any system goes beyond a level of complexity, you cannot use legacy tool. You have to use, treat the whole system as a software development project rather than an admin work. So take an example, if I'm doing a development operation, DevOps guy, say you have a problem, you're say, so your one process is crashing every time. So usually uh, you, uh, traditionally people used to actually manually go and reset the process, reset the virtual machine, or maybe sometimes reset the server also. But with the more as uh, infrastructure is getting cheaper and easily available, it, nowadays people not even bother to restart a server. They just destroy the whole virtual machine and create the environment from scratch because it is easier and less time consuming if you have automated everything. So uh, we'll talk about soon about pet versus uh, cattle approach. So as a DevOps, uh, as a Linux admin guy, these jobs you will be doing, you'll be doing as a Linux admin, you'll be configuration management. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll, we'll talk about Git uh, branch management and everything because admin is one thing. Admin job typically comes, you are managing a Linux server, you are maintaining firewall, you are adding user accounts, deleting user accounts, giving access control. This is typical system admin world. You're managing it. Second thing is configuration management. Configuration management comes into multi, uh, it's like which version of the software is in production, which version should go release. So you have say, if you are a configuration manager, probably you have 20 software under your belt. They need to be released and you have to manage the release cycle. So this version has this fix. So which version will go to production, which version has which uh, tagline. So these kind of things you also have to maintain. So you will do a you will create a git branching strategy and you will enforce it across the organization so that people follow your, uh, your branching strategy. Maybe you will say, I want a master branch called master or maybe a production branch, I will call it that branch will only go in production, nothing else will go. So whenever something is merged into production branch, that will also have a process. Usually none of the code gets into production until it has been okay by QA and then approved by manager or director level, and then it actually goes to production. So till those things are not happening, nothing is being merged to production. So because the moment that you put anything in production, and if you have created a pipeline, code will immediately get deployed in production. So you don't want any uh, unworking piece of code to go deploy. So this is also your job. Build engineer is responsibility to manage like uh, which version of library are matching, which are not matching each day. And uh, most open source project you are using, you'll be using hundreds of open source libraries. And if there is a security patch, assume uh, if you have heard of this heartbeat uh, uh, bug was uh, identified in SSL open uh, SSL library. It is an open source library used for security and it was used by pretty much 90% of the world. And they found out there was a bug which it led people to read the uh, data in open text in a plain text file. So that was a critical bug fix. It was released and it has to be immediately deployed. So that is the build engineer guy. They should uh, quickly switch, switch the build uh, targeting to the new release and build and deploy. And you will also be a developer. Developer in the sense, whatever, whatever tasks I'm talking about, this is all manual task. But as a single person, you won't be able to do any of these as a, if you're doing them by yourself. You have to write code for everything. So you are writing a branching strategy, you will be writing a code, something like maybe in, a, in some kind of automation tool or maybe in Python or somewhere. And so you have to change your brain from thinking at dev admin to developer. And it doesn't happen overnight. Don't believe that, okay, after this course, boom, I'll start flying, no. It is a basic background to give you a base level. And from there, you keep on building on. So you have to, whatever you learn here, Ansible, uh, whatever Bash or uh, Python. So you have to start implementing them into your day-to-day -day job or any kind of thing. So over a period of time, you'll see in few months, you will be very comf uh, comfortable doing anything. So it won't be challenging to you anymore. So in that way, you change your uh, mindset. 
test automation is a, another big thing. Uh, test automation engineer, you don't have to actually write any test cases. Test cases will be written by someone else. You probably have to automate that whole process. So someone says, okay, my web application, say you, you are working for a web application, so e-commerce website. And that e-commerce website, and the tester wrote some kind of, they wrote a script like, uh, which will create a uh, shopping cart, add something, and make sure the checkout works fine. So this is the test case. So you probably have to automate it. So if, if your team doesn't have a test automation engineer, so probably you have to write these kind of scripts, so which will actually automatically create a uh, uh, request to for shopping and add it to uh, your whatever shopping card and does the shipping. If everything is okay, you say this test is passed. And if these kind of all test cases are passed, then you consider pass and then you move to the next step of the pipeline. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the uh, last Chandan, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what are the test cases? Can you please define actually? I just want to, I'm, I'm not getting the test cases meaning. Test case like test case is anything. If you are in a, any uh, software development world, test case could be anything. Say you, uh, you uh, whenever you switch on your uh, phone, right? Okay. So how will you test your phone is working? I mean, it will switch on and after that... Uh... You will make a call. This is one test case. Yeah. You will make a call and if the call is passing through, this means the test case. This is your test case passed. Okay. So same thing if you want to say, if you want to see uh, your internet is working in your phone, how will you do it? You'll probably open Google and okay, Google page is opening, internet is working. So these are all test cases. So whenever, even the Android, say Google, whenever they release their Android package, Android release, they go through at least millions of test cases. They're all automated. So any mm -hmm. build has been delivered to you, even say you have LG phone. So LG, whenever they release their phone, they run extensive tests. They're all automated before they are releasing to customer. So this test case is nothing with the software. It is with the, it is pretty much the industrial concept. Even if you're buying a car, so car company, Toyota or, or Honda or anybody is there. So they will do some kind of a test before they release the car to the customer. So you have a safety test, driving test, everything has to work as per the specification. But by the way, test case always have a, a goal and the end. So you, I cannot expect my uh, phone to fly, right? So um, I'm giving very extreme example, but test case always has a definition. My phone, you define your phone, what your phone should be as a product manager. So you say my phone should be able to make a call, should be able to do internet, and it should be water resistant. But it will not be splash proof. Like if I drop the phone, it will break. That's fine. So, so dropping a phone, this will not consider a test case because this is not my product feature. I don't want. If it breaks, I don't care. But water resistance is my feature. So I will turn on the phone and test case will be drop into a water, take it out. If still the phone is working, this is my test case. So these type of test cases, and these are done by uh, professional testers. You don't have to do it. These are people have been spending their whole life in testing. But your job should be able to, if they have a test script, or they have something like that, you should be able to plug it into the DevOps pipeline and should be able to uh, execute their script. And based on the output of the script, you can make some decision. So this will be your job as a test automation guy. Uh, is that okay? Yeah. Yes, okay. I'm getting it. And then is the, the one of the most important comes is the platform or uh, operation orchestration. Platform operation orchestration mean I say, uh, back in days, like 10, 15 years ago, usually used to be like you, uh, you get a server, say IBM server, big, you build the server, add RAM, everything, you install Linux, and that's it, done, finish. Your job is done. That Linux will never be get wiped out and will run for next 20 years without any problem. This used to be the case. But what happened is with the virtualization, with containerization, and with the cloud, and also I will say the demand of application, it changed so dramatically. Nowadays, people want more and more segregation of application and more and more servers. So take, sim take simple example, your phone. 10 years ago, phone used to be a simple Motorola phone, you know, those uh, text-based phone. Now your phone, pretty much every two years, it becomes useless because the applications are becoming so heavy, so heavy, that even the 8 GB RAM is now, they are saying not enough for the phone. 
they need more so the hardware demand and the application it became exponentially so in now that one server that you used to build is no more enough you need to build more server so it is extremely costly to have buying a one server and building it and keeping it managing it so this is how these big vendors came into picture like amazon azure they said okay don't care about uh, about this uh, Linux boxes, we will give you a virtualized instances and you run your application. So you focus on application development rather than actually building a Linux server, setting the RAM and setting those kind of stuff. So they took this out of the equation. So now, so platform orchestration will be your job as a DevOps or a system admin will be ability to spin up a virtual machine anywhere using some kind of test or it could be in the cloud or it could be inside private cloud also VMware or uh, virtual box anywhere. You should be able to do this, instantiate the whole cluster, uh, like let's say Linux box, assume. And then you install everything like configuration management, test, package, everything, and everything should be automated and it should be part of a script. So next thing I think I have added about this, the evolution of DevOps. So this is where we'll talk about the how uh, the whole thing came out. So this was, I was talking about the orchestration. So you should be able to orchestrate the whole thing your ability is that someone gave you application you should be able to deploy it into the production going through all these job roles like managing and everything so i know it's being weak we'll we'll talk more about it yeah you will get clear so devops evolution this is a very critical thing so devops is like uh, again i say it's no whatever the concept you're saying it's nothing new it has been there but it has been redefined lately in a uh, and the majority driving factor for DevOps evolution has been agile adoption, cloud adoption, and these kind of like service aggregation. You have infrastructure as service, platform as service, and service software as service. And then you have exponential demand for infrastructure and cattle versus pet approach. So first talk about agile. So have you guys heard of a software like SDLC, waterfall model or something like that? Yes. Okay. So waterfall model is a traditional software engineering concept where what it does is it, uh, it, it has a phases like you have a uh, requirement analysis, then you have a design phase, then you have a development, then you have a validation, then you have production. This was a, like they call waterfall model. You have a very defined structured way of doing it and you deliver the software and, and waterfall is very successful, very good model. And it was, I think, still used pretty extensively. And uh, waterfall model, but there are some assumptions into that. Like usually waterfall model, if you have the product lease cycle is usually one year or more than one year. Because you cannot have this kind of strict hierarchical approach if your product release cycle is a week. One week, you cannot do requirement analysis, design. You cannot do it in one week. You need couple of weeks or months for requirement analysis and then you do design. So this was very good working very well. But what happened was as the technology advancement became so fast and people as a, as a consumer, you always want more. You always want bigger screen mobile. You know, you always want bigger game. You want this feature in Facebook, this. So people, the consumer driven market becomes such a way that technology has to move very fast and it was vice versa. Technology was moving fast, so consumer wanted more. So it's a kind of a, uh, you can say a, a loop started that now you have to update your software much quicker and much faster than before. Now you cannot say that, okay, uh, uh, next phone will come in after two years. That company will lose the market because someone else will come with a phone in three months and you will buy that phone and that's it. So now, so agile adoption was one of the, driving factor, what it does, agile, I'm not going to teach here agile, agile is a subject in itself. I don't know, I have created it still, it says. Uh, so uh, I think if the session disconnects, uh, yeah, I'll send you the link again and you join it. It should not disconnect. Uh, uh, just give me one moment. Uh, it should not disconnect.
So agile adoption was that you now you create your uh, whole software development lifecycle from one year and you squeeze them into a couple of weeks. So now you set a target that every two weeks I will release a new software release. Every new weeks there will be update. But each update will be very small incremental update rather than a full big bang upgrade. So take an example of Facebook. If Facebook wants to deploy some uh, change, so they don't do like they don't they didn't change the whole website overnight. They did small changes. They will add one button here, one feature here, one feature here. But it will be very frequent change and over a period of time. But if you see over a period of one year, it will be a big change. But every week you don't see much change. You know, one button, small button. So Agile, what it does, is you take the big task of software uh, development, what you, you are supposed to do in one year. You take this thing, chop it into small tasks or maybe squeeze it all together. And then you create a smaller release cycle. And now if you have a smaller release cycle, assume the amount of uh, work you have to do. Before that, you had a, say for requirement analysis, you had a few guys doing requirement analysis. Then you have three, four designers working design. Then you have a bunch of five, six developers developing. Then you have a test team. And then you have a system. And so this is what old system, system admin was working. Because as a system admin or a configuration management guy, you are not, doing all the busy all the time because you will be managing software deployment for this on say in january you are deploying say software a in february you are deploying software b so basically the configuration management and system admin they can focus on one project at one time and then do a then they will do a big bang upgrade on every uh, for them it will be maybe every month but for the software it will be once in a year but now assume you have the same 10 softwares okay say so and now you want to increase the cycle to two weeks. Every two weeks you want to release it. And if you see, it's just not feasible. With that amount of workforce, you cannot achieve that thing because now you have to hire pretty much 100 people to do that. And the whole point of Agile was to cost reduction and minimize the risk to the business. But if you do these kind of things, basically you are reducing the cost. So, so Agile adoption was the one thing. So they said now, because we have to do so frequently, we have to automate everything. So automate everything. So same way, before you needed a five tester, like you needed usually testing used to be like a two, three testers and one or two test automation. So what did they fire both test automation guy and fire one, two tester, only one tester. Developer will be there. They, you cannot fire basically, you need those developers. Tester got reduced and then you had like four or five system admins. Okay, why we need just fire all of them? So instead of them, they combine all of the whole process into a say bunch of guys. They will be calling as development operation. They will manage this, they will do this, they will do this. So in that way, they are able to minimize the cost. And the same way, they want these people to have developer skill so that they can write code on their own and they can do some kind of automation on their own to minimize the cost. So tomorrow, if I say, I want to release, I want to increase my uh, software release cycle from one month to two weeks. So you have to basically you want to double the speed of release. So in that way, you just have to flip some variables and your pipeline will run twice as fast as this. You don't have to use any manpower. So these were the one of the a major driving factor for DevOps adoption. And second is the cloud adoption. Cloud adoption was that, the day uh, the management of your uh, like this goes back to the same i can give you example of say assume you have a uh, say you have a farm big farm okay you are a farmer yourself and you used to plow the land everything on your own but what happens is as if say if you want to buy a bigger or maybe you want to buy have a two crops in a cycle or maybe four crops and now with the four crops it is almost impossible for you to do it so what you do you take your whole farm and you outsource the management of the farm to some other guy say farming company you sit at home and you just get the paycheck or whatever you get the fruit and you don't care about what is happening you tell a contractor okay you manage my farm you grow the seeds i will just get the fruit and i will take the fruit and maybe i'll make i'll open a restaurant i'll make something from that fruit or whatever make some food from the vegetables so this is the same adoption before you used to manage your own infrastructure you have your own heavy machines managing system administrator reboot monitoring so it was really painful and plus you need a very good skilled people you cannot have like anybody managing your main linux production server if something goes wrong they won't be able to even troubleshoot it so so basically these big companies came with a good skill and all uh, 
power so amazon azure uh, digital ocean these are all ibm they came they said okay leave this whole thing to us we will manage your infrastructure completely give it to us and we'll charge a monthly subscription fee and to for the companies okay I'm, okay i'm fine so first thing how you manage minimize your cost first thing you don't need any hardware so your call hardware cost is zero second you don't need any system admin to manage a fire all the system admin so basically your manpower cost is gone your capex and operation expense all are gone and now you must basically pay maybe 30 dollar 40 dollar monthly fee to amazon and that's all taken care of so for you it's a very win situation and now they want so because the infrastructure whole thing is gone now you can treat the infrastructure as something you can on demand so for on demand you can have a devops guy who can actually manage on demand create the infrastructure and everything and those whatever if say my linux server is down i don't care i just spin up a new server or i will call amazon and they will fix it so this was the one of the reason and uh, it and the, the second and the third is pretty much the similar thing is uh, this the naming of it like cloud computing is you have infrastructure as service it means your infrastructure has been given as service like you uh, you get a virtual linux virtual machine from amazon it is called ias infrastructure as service i'm getting an infrastructure another they call it sorry platform as service if i'm looking for a platform say i want uh, i want a hadoop platform i want say bunch of uh, five server cluster or a file system cluster so those i will call as a platform as service i can again subscribe from amazon and there is another the third is is more mature it's like software as service so say software as service something like uh, say right now i'm using this zoom service right zoom is a is a is a actual example of saas because i i say i want to do a screen share so i don't have to write, uh, install an application which will run a server do this i just pay monthly fee to zoom and zoom takes care of everything so this is software as service godaddy is a software as service or in amazon if you're doing rds which is your taking a subscription for mysql or pg sql any database those are service uh, aggregation or you can call software as service so these are all cloud computing concept and these are the many driving factor for devops so as a devops engineer and also with this approach you don't need database administrator anymore because 10 20 years ago there used to be a dedicated database guy dba 2 not guy there used to be a whole team of database administrator they will manage your oracle database fine tune it do everything and and plus system admin to manage the linux box where this database is installed so can you imagine the cost of managing one database in a typical organization one dba team one sys admin team and hardware and now you what you do you clean all of it just for every clean of it you just pay 60 dollar 70 dollar a month to amazon and all taken care of you are getting a best in class oracles instance so these are the but it's all not all good there is a good and bad both sides like again when you are putting data on amazon your your data basically you are putting data away from you so many organization they do not like it especially banks government they do not want their data to be stored on someone else premise so in that case private cloud still has a value so uh, if you're going for a bank you will still see these system admin but they are still trying to modernize it and the uh, fourth point is exponential demand of infrastructure so as more and more websites are coming people need more people need more memory more i mean see you are using facebook basically facebook i think 10 years ago it was 30 petabyte now i think they have become i don't know 300 petabyte so and if you see even a facebook in past 10 years it has changed dramatically so people are people want more you want more heavy 